This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and, and welcome to worship. It's good to be gathered with God's people today. And a happy Mother's Day. Um, we're grateful for our mothers and, and for those who uh, su- support, supported us and nurtured us. Um, and uh, I've got a, a couple of announcements. Our, our first, um, next Sunday, we're going to have a, a flower sale. Um, and the flowers have been donated to us by Morganville Flower Farm. So all of the proceeds are going to be used for two ministries. Uh, first, fr- friends, uh, Help for the Holidays. The Help for the Holidays ministry, you probably all know, is the one where, in which we, we, buy, uh, we provide uh, meals uh, for families uh, during Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then for some that we are able to identify, we also provide gifts for needy families during Christmas time. That's the Friends Helping Friends ministry. It's supported solely by donations. The second uh, one which will be supported uh, by the flower sale is the, uh, is the Friends Helping Friends. And that's the one, the fund that we have, which is again uh, supported to- solely by donations from the congregation, where we help primarily uh, members of the congregation who need a, 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 a helping hand. Uh, we were able to provide a small uh, um, uh, a hel- uh, amount of money for, for times when there's that kind of a need. Um, and then also next Sunday, so that's the flower sale next Sunday. Also, the clothing drive is next Sunday. So if you've got some gently used clothing, uh, please bring it next Sunday. Um, uh, I know you may be tempted to drop it off during the week, and if you can avoid that, and if at all possible, please bring it just on Sunday. Uh, and that, that will be used, uh, donated to uh, United, the, the uh, Aldersgate United Methodist Church in East Brunswick. And then finally, today we're going to resume uh, uh, serving communion from the altar rail. So I would ask simply that um, uh, continue to observe some personal space. Uh, I know we're, you know, we'd be coming up two, uh, two sides at the same time. So just try to find, you know, find that comfortable space between yourselves. So in case somebody's uncomfortable still by getting with, with, with close social contact that we can just give, give each other some space. And then use your, 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 your judgment as you're kneeling at the rail too. At least leave a, you know, leave a couple of feet between people. It may take us a few more tables, but you know, we'll, we'll be able to resume the, the, uh, using the, um, the altar rail. And I know some people still are not able to, are not able to kneel. Um, and you're welcome to stand at the altar rail. Please don't feel bad if you're not able to kneel and get back up again. Um, that, you know, there's a lot of us that have some, some mobility issues like that. You can stand and feel free to, st- if you're gonna stand, you can stand where, you know, there, or you can stand in the middle if you're more comfortable doing that. Because we're going to be, you know, distributing the, we'll bring the sacrament to you. So just do that according to your comfort level. Kneel if you're able, if you're not, don't, please just stand here. Um, so but we're going to be uh, using the, uh, going back to the, uh, the tables at the, alt, at the, at the, uh, at the rail. Uh, now let's turn our attention to worship and we prepare ourselves by confessing our sins so that we can receive God's forgiveness. Uh, the order of service is from Lutheran Service Book, page 167 or the Pew Edition, page 13. Please find your place and rise and we'll uh, continue together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us, then, confess our sins to God our Father. Most Most merciful God, God, we confess confess that we are by nature nature sinful and and unclean. We have have sinned sinned against against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. 
As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have wakened from death the shepherd of your sheep, grant us your Holy Spirit that when we hear the voice of our shepherd, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapter 20. Now from Malatius, Paul sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the last day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life on any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come, come in among you, not sparing the flock. And for among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. God. The The epistle is from Revelation chapter seven. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and where have they came? I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. 
and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. according to St. John, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, the Feast of the Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Now let us join our voices with Christians from around the world and throughout the ages by confessing our common faith in the triune God using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Charles Porterfield Krauth, a 19th century Lutheran pastor, theologian from the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area. Uh, again, this was around the, you know, both sides of this, both the time of this, the eight, mid-1800s, uh, warned against uh, the creep of false teaching and practices in the church. At that time, uh, revivalism was sweeping across America, Much of what Lutherans taught and believed wasn't really appreciated, so there was a real movement within much of the, uh, some, much, much of the Lutheran church in America at that time to abandon some of our essential uh, 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 biblical beliefs and teachings, like about the Lord, the real presence in the Lord's Supper, and about some of our practices that were more formal. Because at that time, there were the, the things, you have these things, the advent of things like tent meetings and, and these revival kind of things, a very emotionally based, um, fear based uh, Christianity. And, and so that was very popular, sweeping the nation, and there were some prominent Lutherans who wanted to adopt some of those measures and practices, rewriting our confessions and so forth. Charles Porterfield Krauth was, Krauth was, a, was an American Lutheran. Uh, who uh, stood against that and believed in the Augsburg Confession and our other uh, uh, confessions of the church and practices of Lutheranism and saw those things that were valuable, as valuable to the church. And he warned against um, that creep of false teaching and practice in the church that was happening. And, um, 
And, I, and it's, it's also true that, that, well, I'm going to read you the quote in a minute, but to understand that this quote, I think, is relevant to not just our practice inside the church, formally, um, but also as Christians, how our, anywhere where our faith uh, intersects with, with our everyday life, lives. And he wrote this, Krauss wrote this, that error begins by asking toleration, indulged in this for a time, error goes on to assert equal rights. From this point, error soon goes on to its natural end, which is to assert supremacy. Do you see the sequence there? Error begins by saying, let's just get along, you know, just tolerate us. From there, um, it, it then demands, you know, that, that it be treated equally with any other viewpoint and practice. And then finally, once it gets a foothold to say, no, we're the supreme belief system here and you can't believe what you believe, you've got to go along with us or else. Um, the question for us then in the church, or one of the questions at least, is how do we avoid uh, being susceptible to error? Uh, what do we do? How do we avoid it when, it, when it when it comes creeping in here into our church or into our lives? Uh, how do we avoid it? And we see this happening in Jesus' time as well, where error had crept into the Jewish religion. And when their own Messiah comes, they refuse to recognize him. And the John account is one of those occasions where the religious leaders confront Jesus about who he is, what he's saying. Um, and, and they gathered around him, John wrote, and said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And it's not that they were curious. Uh, if we go on and, and as we go on and read this account from John 10, Jesus said, I've told you already. You just don't believe it. But here Jesus comes, and he comes into this world and into this place. And as John you know, sets this up in John chapter 1, and he comes to his own, and his own don't receive him. You think, why in the world would somebody come to a place where nobody wants him? And the interesting thing about it, the wonderful, beautiful thing about it, is Jesus came precisely because they didn't want him, because they didn't receive him, couldn't receive him, couldn't understand him. And that didn't just go for the Jewish people at the time. They were the ones whose history had brought us all in the world to this point where the Messiah finally comes because they had prepared the way for the coming of the Messiah. And they were just another human example of when the Lord comes into the world in the flesh that we reject him because in our flesh we can't receive him or understand him or believe in him. And that's why he had to come. But here they are saying, listen, tell us plainly as if that would have been enough. But it's proper to understand the reason Jesus came and why we are able to avoid now in our lives error when it comes creeping in and have a means or a mechanism to resist it, to stand against it. Jesus came into the world for the very purpose to, of combating lies, combating lies and misbelief with his plain truth. And when you think about religion and truth and compare the truth of Jesus to almost all other religions, it's pretty straightforward. We're sinners. We need a savior. God sent him into the world to be our savior. He lived in the flesh, demonstrating to, to us what God is really like and how much he wants to be with us. And then he goes to a cross to overcome sin and death and the devil and our own misbelief or unbelief. And he cracks that wide open by dying and rising again from the dead. And he gives us the commandments, the law that tells us, here's how people ought to live. And religious and unreligious cultures have, have adopted many of those laws for their own societies because they're just common sense. They're plain speaking about what does it mean for people to get along together? What's fair? What's right? What's just? And we see it delineated in the laws of God intended for people's good order and good living together. And of course, there's the first table of the law that says, here's how it should be between you creatures and your creator. He's your God. Worship him. You know, you, you pray to him. Honor him. Uh, follow his guidance and his directives. 
And then here's how you are to live with one another. They make perfect sense. Jesus comes into the world then, and he doesn't come as some, as some high thinking or, or floating above it all mystic, but rather as an ordinary human being. And he comes and very plainly demonstrates what God intends for us, what he expects, and then he goes on to achieve it on our behalf so that we can take part in all of that. It was told plainly to people then as it is now. And Jesus came because it was the only way for God to combat the lies that started with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when Eve bought into that first lie of the devil and went along. And then her corrupted belief system then leads to, and and Adam's as well, leads to all of the chaos we see in the world around us now. Unimaginable chaos, but it's always the devil's intent. The father of lies to, 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 to create chaos and death in the world. That's his to- sole purpose in, in his existence. And we see it happening all around us in the world. That's why Jesus came to combat those lies and this misbelief, because only his plain truth offers a, an alternative. So that's why Jesus came into the world, and we know what he did when he came. But I think it's important for us to consider what does this have to do with us then, as we sit in the pews and go home and live with our families and go out to work and and live in this world that is kind of swirling around us, it seems, sometimes. But where do we fit in? What does what Jesus did have to do with us? Besides saving us and making us part of his church, giving us eternal life. Is there more than that? Well, when it gets down to it, if you think about it, we should follow Jesus. And and as part of following Jesus, that includes resisting lies. Uh, When Jesus is talking to these leaders who had come and challenged him, Uh, He said, he answered them, John writes, he answered them in verse 25, I told you, and they say, tell us plainly, and he says, I told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. He's telling me, I've told you already with my words, I'm showing you by fulfilling the prophecies about the Messiah who would raise the dead, heal the sick, preach the gospel to to the poor. I'm doing all of that right in front of you for your eyes to see plainly. Besides what I'm saying is I deliver God's truth to you and you still don't believe it? There's a problem. Um, But he didn't stop doing it. He kept doing it in public, right in their faces. Not because he wanted to be mean or just to to humiliate them. But, you know, Jesus always has has the the other's well-being in in mind. And so what this has to do with us in, in our lives and as our role as Christians in the world today is that we should not give in to indifference, ignorance, or misbelief. We shouldn't give in to it whether it's happening in our own hearts or whether it's happening in, in the lives of people around us or as we think about our roles in our society and the opportunities that we have and sometimes don't have, as we have sometimes given a larger public voice, we should not give in to it on the larger scale, the global scale even, but in a society scale, on our scale of our society. When people attack our children and what they believe and forbid the, 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 uh, the expression of our own faith in public, because it offends somebody. The, 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 the saying that it's hate speech to call sin, sin, whether it's in our, sin in our own hearts or sin that's happening publicly in the world around us. And it's forbidden for the church to proclaim God's clear word, plain word, in a public square because it's deemed to be hate speech or something like that. We should not give in to that. When it comes to ourselves personally, we shouldn't give in to our own indifference when we recognize it. Indifference that says, you know what? God's word maybe says it or maybe doesn't, but whatever it is, 
Jesus will take care of it. I'm just keeping my head down because, well, it's just not, it's too, it takes too much energy. And all of us has some of that going on inside of ourselves. It's the old nature where we think, you know what? I'm not going to worry about it. I don't want to think too deeply about it. It makes me feel bad. I don't want to get involved. That indifference often leads to our own ignorance about what does God really say? And here we have the, 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 uh, the actual core of what happens as is, is it's demonstrated in, in Genesis chapter 3, where, where Eve sins and the devil says, you know, did God really say? And, 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 and because of ignorance, we either add to God's word or take away from it or just completely ignore it. It doesn't just happen outside the church. It happens inside the church, too. And I would bet if we each look close enough, it happens in each of our hearts from time to time, and maybe more often than we recognize or would like to admit. But we shouldn't give in to it, whether it's happening inside of us or outside of us personally. Whether it's happening inside the church or outside the church, where it's proper to understand how it intersects and how we ought to be uh, properly speaking about those things and to them. And then to the misbelief that just is a direct affront on what the Bible teaches, whether that comes from ourselves and some Christians in the church, because it happens, people get misguided. Well, ways sometimes, and there's misbelief that creeps in. Quite often it's because of the indifference and ignorance, but Besides, beside the point, because we're all a work in progress, as they say. And when it comes from overt attacks from outside the church that point the finger and challenge our beliefs, we should not give in to it. Because when we give in, it's simply an indication that we don't care. And it's not the caring about ourselves, because Jesus didn't come because he had something to prove. He came because he wanted to help the people that were caught up in the lies and were caught up in the indifference and the ignorance and the misbelief. And he wanted to give a correct understanding of God and a, and a, right, and a, and a right approach to it all so that we could be helped. He came to bring the right medicine, the only medicine that can cure the sickness that we all have when it comes to sin. And when we give up on the people around us, it's an awful thing to do because it's simply an indication, well, we don't care what happens to them. We're fine. We know what we believe. Let them all go to hell because we don't care. Well, we need to repent of that too when that creeps into us. And we all get worn down by the stuff that's happening around us. And sometimes, you know, it's just good to recognize at least that, you know what, it's, 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 it's just taking its toll. What are we to do about it? But we need to get it into our heads that we don't want to give in. We don't want to give in, and we can become discouraged when we think that we're in this alone. But we have a Savior who came into the world for this very reason. You see, Jesus gives power to believe the truth. We can't do that on our own. We don't have the power to persuade somebody by our own cleverness to believe it. Although it's good to engage, Ultimately, it's only Jesus who gives a person the power to hear the truth and to believe it. Jesus said to those who well, he was discoursing with here and, arg and they, who were arguing and trying, maybe trying to trap him even, because they had, had done that at other times, and where he addresses their own unbelief, he says to them, well, my sheep hear my voice. You know, he says, no, you're not my sheep, but he says, to, to, but, but my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. We hear his voice because he speaks to us clearly and plainly with a message that redeems us and saves us and encourages us and delivers to us the things that it promises. A crucified, risen Savior who brings forgiveness into our midst and delivers it to us each week. And every time we approach him, his voice is saying the same thing. Come to me, follow me. It's good news that he has for us. And he doesn't stop speaking it. My sheep hear my voice. We hear it because he speaks to us. And he says, and I know them. He called you by name when you were baptized. He knows you intimately. He knows you with all of your good parts and your bad parts. 
your thoughts, your words, your deeds, things that we don't even know about ourselves are known to Jesus, yet it doesn't change his mind. He still loves you. He still looks and says, that's why I came to die on the cross, because I love you, and that's the reason I came. Not because we're good, but because we are all at times indifferent and ignorant and have a distorted understanding of our own faith. He knows us and yet still loves us and died for us. And he says, because of that, then they follow me. We are able to follow our Lord because he gives the gift of faith and forgiveness. And when we get to a place where we wander off like sheep are, 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 are prone to do, he doesn't, and, and, and out of range of his voice, he doesn't stop talking or calling, but rather he comes out and he finds us where we are so that we can still hear his voice. And sometimes he uses the rod and the staff. And nobody likes the rod and the staff. We look at him and we think, that could sting a little bit or hurt. But it's always with the same intent. Our good shepherd is guiding you to true life with him. Whether it's his gentle word or sometimes the, the prod of the rod and the staff. As the psalmist wrote, his rod and his staff, even they comfort me. Because ultimately they lead to the pastures that he provides for us. The word of truth that feeds our faith, feeds our souls, and lead to, leads to eternal life. And then, how can we respond to that as we sit here and think, okay, it, it makes sense, but here we are still, same as we were when this all started. How can we respond? The gift that he's given us is repentance. You can repent and then stand with Jesus. Jesus said, he promises, verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. If we were left to our own devices and our own strength, it wouldn't be long before some powerful force came along and just snatched us up and threw us to the side and went on to its next victim. Our, the promise and our hope is in this word of Jesus who assures us that no one will snatch them out of my hands, he says. We know that he has you in his loving hands. So you can follow Jesus and hold on to his good truth. You can speak the truth in love and stand up for it. But you know that hearing that word of truth may make any of us uncomfortable for a while. That's the nature of God's law. None of us wants to hear it sometimes. But its aim is always to point you to Jesus and guide you into his nail-scarred, loving hands. And now from the words of St. Paul from Acts 20, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Amen. Please stand now and let us pray for the whole church and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, as the shape of your son's fold, inspire us to hear his voice gladly and to follow him steadfastly through every tribulation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, shepherd of our souls, bless your church under the care of her pastors and instill in them all wisdom, fortitude, humility, and grace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh Lord, bless those, those who have shown us a mother's love and nurtured our lives from childhood. Bless and protect all mothers with child, all those who have suffered miscarriage, 
or the death of a child, and all those who have yearned for a child and lived with the pain of this unfulfilled longing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Compassionate Father, give us wise and faithful leaders, legislators, and judges who will govern in our land according to your law and defend the lives of the unborn, the orphaned, the widowed, and the aged. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, deliver the sick and suffering according to your will, and give your comfort to the dying and to those who have requested our prayers. Today we pray especially for Joan Chadwick, who's in the hospital, for healing and comfort, for strength and healing for Lenny, Gloria, John, Susan, Sharon, Dot, Carol, Sue, and another Sharon, and for Daniel uh, Demarest, uh, um, Alice's nephew, who's recovering from bypass surgery. And we pray, too, today for the staff, the Crossroads staff in our infant room, Crystal, Wahida, Andrea, Stephanie, and Anmal. We ask that you would bless them, Lord, with fortitude, patience with the children, and that you would make them a blessing to these children who uh, come to our school and to their families. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Eternal Lord, by your grace, bless all who receive our Lord's body and blood in the sacrament today. Help them by this sacrament to live out their baptismal life, dying in repentance and being raised in the faith. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated now while the offering would ordinarily be collected. We're going to sing a hymn of offering while we prepare the altar for the Lord's Supper.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, and most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ the very Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death, and by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth, to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace to life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.